Hello, senior designers. I'm here to talk to you today about engineering economics. I'm Professor Vigent, and uh, I made this presentation with a lot of help from my colleagues, Prince Snyder and Manival. So let's talk about engineering economics. Let's start by imagining a situation that may, you may encounter as early as next year when you're in the workforce. So you're gonna select piping for a new installation. And okay, maybe you're never gonna actually select piping. Sub in in your head, something that you might uh, select. Because this is a situation that recur recurs often. That is, we can have something that has an immediate low cost, say $30,000 for pipe of material A, but higher maintenance cost, $10,000 every four years to clean it out, or you can spend more money immediately to have a more robust system to begin with. In this case, $70,000 right now. Um, in either case, the design lifetime here is 20 years. So here we are. You are making this decision, or at least making this recommendation to the person who's gonna do the purchasing. What are you gonna recommend? I want you to hit pause on the video, and I want you to spend five minutes or less trying to calculate this out. And maybe you know the equations already, maybe you don't, that's okay. If you don't know the equations, don't start necessarily by Googling them, just try and do this off the top of your head. Feel free to talk to your teammates if they're around. Okay, welcome back. I hope you have a recommendation for me. I will be interested to hear that, or your instructor will be interested to hear that when you meet up in class. Let's talk through what the point of today's set of lectures is. We want you to think about the time value of money and what that has to do with engineering. We want you to be able to use that to look at current values of, of money, cash flows, and future ones, past ones even. We want you to be able to create what's called a cash flow diagram. And then to be able to use all those tools to determine the net present value of your design, or if you'd rather return on investment or payback period. That's what we're after here. So what's the deal with engineering economics? I want you to know these next 12 minutes are not gonna replace you taking an actual economics course. The idea here is we want you to be able to have a competent conversation with your manager because a key element of creating value is convincing other people that the thing you're uh, pitching is more valuable than something else they might be doing. And while there are many ways to construe value, a really convenient one is to talk about things in terms of money. So it helps to be able to think about economics and money in terms of its time value and, uh, and how that all works. So there you go. We want you to be able to communicate this with your manager. So we have pretty much two equations here. Here comes one of them. Let's talk about compound interest. So let's, let's think about this. You've heard of interest. That's somehow you get more money uh, because you've put some money in the bank for example. That's because, well, the value of money changes with time. So right now, this very instant, whatever money is uh, you have or your project has is called your present value. So I'm going to call that P in this equation. And then every so often, the value of that changes, upgrades, uh, because a period has passed and it has been incremented by the accumulated interest. So we could write that this way. So the value at the end of period one, say that's a month from now, is uh, one, because we didn't lose any of your money, plus the interest rate. And that's always, usually you say it as a percent, so you gotta remember to turn that percent into an actual number, times your initial investment. Make sense? Sure. Now, when you go into the second period, say month two, you have not only the money you started with, but that little bit of extra money you got from the interest in period one. And so now you get a little bit more interest because the original, the amount of money you had that that interest is compounding on is higher. 
Okay, so this is what that looks like. So we can extend this on and on for a number of periods until we get ta -da, the future value of, uh, of our money. So F equals P, which is the money value of this money right now, or the value of this investment right now. And then that's times one plus the interest rate, remember expressed as a number, not as a percent, raised to the power of the number of compounding periods. All right, let's use that, right? Oh, I also wanted to mention, you can use this to have money go backwards if you want to know what happened in the past. Uh, and you can do that, you just make n negative. So let's do an example. Or when I say let's, I mean you're gonna do the example. Uh, let's have you take $10,000 and put it in the bank. And you're gonna, you have a high rate CD, which has an annual percentage rate of 2.5%. That's kind of high for right now, but <clears throat> maybe you can get one of those. Uh, after four years, what is the value of this investment? Okay, so I'm gonna have you work this out three different ways. And I'm gonna talk you through this. A is if the interest is compounded annually. So that means you're going to have four periods. B, if the interest is compounded monthly, and there's a special note on that, you have to keep I, your interest rate, in the same period value as your N, the number of periods you have. So since I called your initial per, uh, percentage rate, APR, 2.5%, compounded annually, that means we can use 2.5 as, uh, or actually 0 0.025 as our value in part A. But in part B, since we are switching the compound interval, you have to work things out in terms of months instead. So do you see, I have that note there, you're gonna divide it by 12, all right? So just pay attention to what's going on. And then you will do C, now C, has a slightly uh, different equation to it because if it's compounded continuously, you can imagine we've taken something that's discrete and turned it into a continuous curve. Hey, look, that's an integral. That means we use this other equation instead. And that's not the word in, that's I interest rate times N, um, the overall period, okay? So what happens there? So we are once again, hit and pause. You're getting out a calculator or using your phone, whatever and work this out. Go back if you need to, to get the equation from the previous page so you can figure this out. I want you to know um, what you've got here. Uh, I want to know how much money you have at the end in A, B, and C, and uh, also, you know, which one's the better deal? Which, which way would you prefer to invest if possible? All right, welcome back. Let's talk about pardon me, fun ways to use this equation. So I really recommend you use this equation to figure out what the heck's going on before you do something like sign an auto lease or buy a house or take out another loan. You should check this out. How much does it actually cost you to borrow some amount of money at 5% interest? Another way to use this, it helps you bring uh, values to the current time. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this situation. You wanna take a certification course. Say you get certified um, in JavaScript, something like that. It's gonna cost you a thousand bucks to get that certification. That certification means that every pay period, you're, you're gonna get uh, started being paid more highly. So you get 20 bucks more in each biweekly paycheck. Um, when you start work. Does it make sense for you to spend that thousand bucks now? Or, you know, will, will that pay back? All right, so you can start thinking about this. The thousand bucks now, a uh, thousand bucks right now is worth a different amount of money than a thousand bucks in the future. This helps you capture that idea. All right, finally, here's one that's kind of complicated. 
uh, your current in your current process, our client has an error rate of one product in a hundred, which costs some amount of money per each error. With a capital investment of fifty thousand dollars, they can cut that down to one error out of a thousand. Should they spend that fifty thousand dollars or not? Hmm. We're going to have to dive a little deeper to be able to work uh, this out more effectively. So let's let's talk about this. Here comes our next set of equations. We're, I'm going to introduce the idea of the cash flow diagram. Those of you who've taken linear algebra will recognize a little bit what's going on here. We're going to use vectors. Um, maybe if you go back, I know all of you saw this in physics in some way. So what we've got here is a timeline. Right now is at zero. Then we've got the past. Cash in is going to be an arrow pointing up out of our timeline. Cash out is going to be pointing down out of our timeline. Each interval is a period, could be a year, could be a month, depends on what your, your compounding interval is. And at the future, it's n, right? That's the, the number of compounding periods we have. When you are looking at something like this, you uh, imagine the cash flow happens at the end of the period. So like it's all happening on December 31st, even though it doesn't really. But we just assume that to make the math tractable. OK, so we're going to have some sales. And we're going to use the term annuity to describe those sales. What does that mean? It means it's the same amount of money every year for some, or, or every period for some number of periods. And you're like, well, sales could go up, sales could turn down. No, we're not going to fuss about that right now. We're going to assume that you are selling $50,000 worth of widgets every period for the rest of forever. So we line those up. And uh, we're going to build the widget factory. So right now, we don't, we're not making money from the widgets. Um, but one year from now, we will be. OK, then we've got an annuity in the opposite direction. We've got some operating costs. We've got to pay the people who work in the factory. We've got to pay the electricity. Uh, we have to keep the lights on. We have to keep the power going, et cetera. So that's negative cash flow. That's money going out of our system. Because vector math is a thing, we can knock those together, boom. Ideally, by the way, <laughs> you really hope those red arrows are smaller than the green arrows, but they aren't always. Um, sometimes it, it can be OK for some of these to point down. Here is the equation that describes <coughs> what just happened. Let me take you through this equation. P, the present value of our investment is equal to, well, there's I again. That's kind of our interest rate times capital N raised to the capital N power. The capital N is the total number of times we expect this annuity to be paid. So quite often, you will hear about a facility being built for a 10-year lifespan or a 20-year lifespan. So we assume we're going to make this widget for 20 years. So n, if we're compounding yearly, would be 20 in this case. And then a is the value of that annuity. And that's the total annuity once we've taken into account the money coming in and money going out. Make sense? Now, you'll notice this only works, this equation only works to describe things that are happening the same way every year. And that's a fine way to start at this level of design. Now I'm going to take you to the big money equation. Here we go. Ta-da! It is, in fact, the big money equation. This is the way we will describe net present value. What the heck does that mean? Well, this is what lets us make a decision on, for example, the two different kinds of pipes versus each other. Uh, or should your uh, client make an investment of a certain kind or another in, the, uh, in what you're telling them to do? Net present value takes all of the money over the course of this whole project that's going to go out, that's going to come in, um, and brings it to today's dollars, even though this project is going to take years, probably, when people implement it. And this allows us to think about, is this a good decision or not? So uh, pause for just a second in your own head. Net present value should be what sort of number? I hope you said positive. Positive is the thing you want to say. So net present value wants to be positive, could be zero. That means you are just breaking even. 
If it's negative, eh, this is probably not a thing that makes sense to do. So let's take you through this. So net present value, there it is, is equal to your total capital investment. And this is assuming you are making that capital investment right now at time zero. So that's what, that kind of what is what defines time zero. So that's whatever infrastructure you need for your design project. So some of you have projects where <laughs> you're recommending pieces of the plant with large equipment. Uh, some of you are recommending kind of much more modest things, um, like sm smaller changes, procedural changes. Maybe you have no capital investment at all. That's cool. But this is, and capital is the durable equipment sort of thing. So this isn't people, but this is, you're gonna buy a uh, filter press. You are gonna buy a pump. That's capital equipment. Um, you might have to build a building, for example. That could also be capital investment. Okay, we add to that the value of our annuity. So just like I showed you from the, the diagram, your annuity is uh, all of the money that you expect to come in on a regular basis and all of the money minus all of the money that's going out on a regular basis. So this is where kind of the people and the operating costs come in. We'll talk about a little bit more what might go into here, uh, but that is that equation is sitting there. Then next over, we either add or subtract, kind of depending on uh, what uh, direction the money is going, any other one-time expenses other than the total capital investment that are gonna be happening out in the future or happened out in the past. So what could be something like that? Well, if you know, this machine has to be replaced <coughs> like that pipe we were talking about before. We know it has to be replaced after four years or, or cleaned out after four years. So we could put that here. That's a little less, um, you could work the math that you could construe that as an annuity, but because it is not happening every year, you may want to just work it in kind of by hand by putting it here. Okay, and there you go. There are some other factors we are ignoring. For example, right now we're ignoring depreciation and salvage and holding on to cash on hand. Um, where you work eventually, you might need to consider these things. Uh, but also, honestly, at the first level of design, making the case that this is worth, uh, this project that you're thinking of is worth pursuing further, that stuff doesn't tend to come in at this level. Also, you know, the world contains finance majors and we need them to have something to do. So that, that mostly can be their problem. I just want you to know that taxes are out there, okay? All right, let's talk about the value of the annuity. Uh, it's obviously sales and obviously manufacturing costs and that's personnel is in there too. Um, if the taxes, depending on, <coughs> if we're talking about taxes that occur every year, they might be in the annuity. If we're talking about one-time things, they, uh, they would be elsewhere. Um, you are allowed in here to work in your triple bottom line. So if you've done a life cycle analysis and you want to include in your uh, annuity the environmental costs or benefits of whatever it is you're doing, and you can change that into a money format, um, just because that makes things kind of easier to in, uh, uh, balance the costs and benefits of, please do that. You can do that here, all right? So we can work all of this in. And there you go, that's it. So you line all this up, you make sure, you know what, oh, here's a question. Uh, you know, the rate of return, where am I gonna get that rate of return from? Well, uh, some companies will have a rate of return as policy. We expect a rate of return of this much. And so you have to use that number. Um, I'll tell you something else you can do with that later. At the very least, I ought to be uh, the rate of uh, uh, inflation. Sorry, just went out of my head. Uh, it ought to be the rate of inflation, right? Uh, because at the very least, this thing shouldn't uh, be costing more uh, or making less money as time goes on. The little n is the project lifespan in years, and the capital N is the number of annuity payments. If we have this all set up uh, in alignment, 
those should both be on a yearly basis and then they'll be the same number uh, numerically. But <clears throat> depending on how you have set up your math, they may not be. Project lifespan, again, another thing a company will usually tell you that they want to make sure that this is ex at least 20 years or no, we don't care about anything more than five years out. So you can work this out and you can figure out what is the net present value of your process. And that's uh, sometimes that's what people want to hear. Other times there's um, ways of thinking about this that uh, speak more to your audience. And let's talk about a couple of those. So here's the equations again, sitting here. A, remember that's the, the size of your annuity. So a thing you could do is you could set, so this is one equation, that means we get one unknown. As initially presented, net present value is the unknown. But you could instead phrase this in terms of net present value, I'm setting it equal to zero, that's the break even point. And now my unknown is going to be A, that annuity. And that allows you to back out what must be, for example, the selling price of my product. If uh, my client has said this thing, this widget uh, has a target price of 50 bucks. And you're like, okay, well, <laughs> can you pay off your uh, project as proposed in a reasonable number of years with a $50 selling price? Do you end up with a positive NPV at that selling price? What is the minimum selling price you can get away with and still break even? So that's NPV of zero, which no one actually wants, but you can set it to that, all right? So that's your break even. Um, another way of looking at this is messing with N. You know, how long is this gonna go? So you may, for example, say, what is our payback period? Um, in classic examples of engineering economics, we use numbers like five years for a payback period. When I have spoken to our clients in senior design and in other classes talking to alums, I hear about payback periods more along the lines of one year, 18 months. Uh, wow, okay. So you definitely will want to know what your uh, client thinks of is a reasonable payback period. So if you change that, and again, you set the NPV to zero, that's the break even point, and you mess around with N till you see um, how long is that gotta be, okay? So you can do all of these different things. You can also use this uh, to think about return on investment. And that would be uh, uh, comparing your NPV to that total capital investment, because that's what you, that's the big thing you put in to begin with. And the NPV is, uh, <coughs> from this point standing here, what you see yourselves getting out of it. Each of these is a different way of saying pretty much the same thing, but what speaks to your client to communicate your value proposition uh, varies. And uh, if you are a team that is designing a product, uh, it's probably best to think about a, you know, changing uh, your, your sales price to see what is the minimum viable selling price for this. Uh, if you are doing something that's more uh, durable, maybe you want to look at payback period. Any of these might work for what you're doing. So here you go. Here is your try it. And this will be a, uh, an assignment written up for you. But really, you should think about it as any reasonable design. If you are ever designing anything in your career, you should be able to communicate in terms of uh, financial outcome what is, uh, what is likely as a result of your project, okay? So for your current understanding of your project, set up a spreadsheet, make spaces for those variables, <coughs> and conduct a few experiments, a few models. For a given estimate of TCI, what's your payback time? What is a reasonable sales price if you want this all to pay for itself in 18 months? What's the net present value if this project runs for 20 years? And like I said, your client is probably not interested in all three of these, but they are definitely interested in at least one of them. So in conclusion, 
money changes its value over time. You got to know that. Compound interest, we've got an equation. Use it, love it, be its friend. Um, a constant rate annuity, we got an equation for that. And we have a way to put these things together to describe an engineering project, all right? And presenting a compelling economic case to your client is a significant part of adding value. So do it. Talk to you later.